that's what they use as, as a standard. Oh, I would love to, but they do make one for the bigger, heavier trucks that the hitch goes into a truck and it has the four brackets you could slide that into. Yeah, I saw that rig and I was just like, this is looking really involved. Yeah. And we, and we, you know, did, we did find the comparison because we were going on the same highways out to the Silver Avion rally this, this year right. with the Hensley compared to the Gen Y and especially on Route 90, <laughs> yeah. we absolutely could feel the difference. We got a lot more of that of that pounding, pounding than when we had the Gen Y. Okay. Yeah, the Hens. I mean, the Hensley has a lot of other advantages, but we definitely felt a stiffer pounding on those. On I mean, those uh, your trailer has been to Phoenix, Arizona, and back. Along 10, 70, 80, you know, with the Hensley on it. And I never had any problems towing it. Mm -hmm. Gen Y came out sometime after I had the Hensley, so I wasn't aware of what its features were and what I'd give up giving Gen Y versus having Hensley. Um, I probably tow with a heavier speed going cross country if doing 70. And I, okay, I'll tell you, I've lost a wheel on your trailer and didn't feel it in the cab. I had somebody flag me, hey, you lost a wheel. <laughs> and the Hensley just kept it straight down the road. So if you want an endorsement, there it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Cheryl and Bill, do you have any, what, why don't we just open up the question? Just, uh, Turn your computer. Oops. Let's just open it. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're going to get a new system, so I don't have to do that. Um, <laughs> let's just open it up, especially since we have some first time people here. Let's, you know, open the discussion up for questions and then anybody can chime in with answers. Okay. Fire away, anybody. So I know that the hitch. We have a hitch on our trailer that actually I said in the last meeting, we have the original Trunnion bars that came with the trailer and they provide both weight distribution and some sway control. And then we bought a receiver for the truck, a heavy duty receiver for the, for the expedition that also is adjustable up and down where we can set it to get the proper level for the trailer when towing. Your My question is adjustable or the hitch head is adjustable? The hitch head is adjustable. I can move it up or down and rebolt it in place. Okay. Yeah. But 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 I think I spent altogether only about two or three hundred bucks. Now I know if you're talking about a Hensley or a Gen Y, I mean you can kind of spend almost as much money as you want to. And I mean, what a, what is like a a Hensley will run you like a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars mm -hmm. for a good setup with a Hensley, right? I mean, it's not cheap to get one of those uh, really nice hitches. I got my first Hensley off of a was called the Tidewater Trading Post for four hundred dollars. The guy was like, "Did I screw up?" He says, "Yeah, you screwed up when you sold it." <laughs> yeah. <no kidding. laughs> Uh, I think they're going what twenty eight hundred, Kevin. Twenty eight hundred yeah. now. On a, yeah. On a special deal, twenty eight hundred to three thousand. Wow. Yeah. Now, when I when we towed fifth wheels, I had a three thousand pound air hitch that I had installed in the back of our F four fifty, and then I also had the complete rear suspension replaced with a fully air suspension on the back end of the F four fifty as well. So I'm not adverse to spending a lot of money on a hitch, but to be honest with you, the one I have seems to work really well. I don't have any problems with it. And so like, uh, like Emily and Aaron had said, you know, they towed theirs with the hitch that they had and it seemed to work fine. I would say unless there's mm -hmm. structural issues with the equipment that you have, I just stick with that for now 
unless you want to go out and spend three thousand dollars on a different hitch <laughs> you like may we said earlier, we're going full-time and right. there's a lot more advantages to that setup i mean this yes. is an investment in my this is our house so i'm going to willing to spend the more effort to make sure i get what i need out of it right we're staying Certainly. in line and everything else but the equalizer we had was great with a Gen Y just to take that pounding out. We, we did it with a 2005 Suburban with only the 5.3 and the four speeder. Mm -hmm. And that got like 12 and a half uh, towing at 60, 62. And, but that just that pounding, I, you know, was really nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The important thing is go online to your setup, your company, whoever you have, and make sure you set up the truck or vehicle according to the way they have it set up. Because you have to understand you know, your truck measurement, your back measurement of your vehicle, and go by how they had them set up. Because you just yeah. can't like put it together and say it's going to work. You have to dial it into your vehicle and your truck or whatever, yeah. according to the manufacturer recommendations. Yeah, that's definitely true. And you have to make sure that your weight distributing bars and everything are the right size for the trailer you have. Um, cause there are different weight values for some of the weight distribution bars as well. And if yours are too light or too heavy, they won't do the job that they were designed to do. Dennis, um, Cheryl, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering what, uh, what the reason I'm looking is because we had the old Ford truck with a, uh, pretty heavy duty, um, head on it that uh, was welded together and and it's, it's a reese uh, set up with those square trunnions i guess and um the chains on the end well it just it doesn't really fit this newer pickup which the ram is a lot higher and uh, when i hooked it up to that the uh, bumper was almost the rear bumper was almost on the ground so uh, i think yeah <laughs> I don't think that's going to work, but uh, yeah. I'm thinking, what is, what does the fellow with the Legrand and the Cummins diesel have? What do you have that that's similar to what we're, we have, you know, that set that trailer and it's just a longer trailer, but with the Ram pickup uh, at that height. And I'm, I'm, I haven't heard that there are hitches that are way more expensive. I just started looking at Reese and Kurt and some of those that have, stabilization bars but uh what at what point do you go from a 500 hundred dollar hitch to a th do you can you go to a thousand and fifteen hundred and then three thousand or how many different setups are there and what what should we be thinking of i guess um i don't think that old thing it's not worth trying to convert or yeah Dennis, I think this is your chime in because you're the one with the Ram, right? With the 28 footer. What kind of hitch do you have? We're using the original OEM uh, dual cam sway control that came with the trailer. Okay. It was very well maintained uh, and coupled with an adjustable hitch on the Ram, it rides level. We have had, had zero issues with it. We've had the trailer 13 years. <clears throat> One year we went to Southern California to represent Tin Can Tourists at a finished trailer rally. And by the time we got through with that, we were on the road for three months and 15,000 miles. Uh, we've been to Michigan back several times. Um, in fact, we just got back from San Antonio yesterday. And like I say, the original hitch that came with the trailer, I've had absolutely no issues with. It's never scared me going down the freeway. You get a, you get a semi that blows past you, you can feel the bow wave. But the trailer track's really nice. I mean, I did, didn't see any reason to to change or upgrade to anything else. It works, so I'm happy with it. I think if you get, I think if you get an adjustable hitch, that's going to allow, and you can buy some with some pretty wide mm. range of adjustment on them. Yep. You can really drop that ball on the back of the truck down pretty low. I mean, I've seen guys with jacked up, big wheel looking F-250s and things that are towing boat trailers level and they've got a 
hitch receiver on the back of the truck that's got about a foot and a half of adjustment on it. So they can drop that ball way down low. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there are, there are hitch, hitch receivers out there that you can do that with, and you can get a level ride even with a four-wheel drive pickup. Yep. So do we want to be towing that trailer level? Yes. Oh, yes. Most definitely. Absolutely. Or the refrigerator just, blows up, right? <laughs> well, the heard. refrigerator is only one issue. The other issue is if your trailer is too many degrees tilted back or too many degrees tilted forward, what happens is, is you're putting the bulk of the weight of the trailer on one set of wheels and one axle. And so you end up over, you, you can end up ruining the axle and the tires and whatnot a lot quicker if you're not towing level. Yeah, the trailers well, are designed to tow level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the purpose of, the purpose of weight distribution is to spread the load out between the front and rear axles of the tow vehicle, as well as the, tra the axles on the trailer. And if you end up with tongue high and rear end low on the trailer, you run a greater risk of having that thing wagging your tail as you're going down the road. Sure. No, that shouldn't be a problem. It's just what what level of hitch to get. I guess from what I'm hearing, it's I don't. We didn't get. I don't know what the setup was. It must have been a Reese thing that was. Uh, it had welding on it, so it it looked to me as if it had been uh, modified or something. So. Mm -hmm. And dropping that isn't really, I can't f see an option to, it. I towed it when we bought it with the Ford and it was all set up for that vehicle. And uh, I was going 70 and, and you know, that was without ha having any knowledge of the, what we bought. And it was, uh, <laughs> it worked out okay. I mean, it was, you know, it actually towed pretty well and, but, uh, just trying to get it all set up for uh, some touring, so we'll see. Yeah. You're you're going to have to establish your trailer's level height, front to rear. <laughs> you know, tape measure, take tape measure measurements front to rear, mm -hmm. so you're sitting level on the trailer, and then establish where is your hitch height, receiver height on your mm -hmm. truck. And that is going to give you a measurement between A and B. Right. And that's where you need to come in at with your hitch head. Okay. When I, uh, when I first got our rig, it had all the original documentation with it as far as setting up hitch and everything. And it said to uh, have your hitch ball, the top of the hitch ball, at 19 inches above the, the ground, which is that's how I set it up. And once you add on the, the weight of the trailer, then jack up your spring bars that's how i arrived at perfectly level and that was based on the dimensions that was supplied in the owner's manual mm -hmm. yeah yep the 70 series yeah yeah the 19 uh, kevin just said too the 1970s avions they're all i ours was 19 inches as well yeah um but do they switch over to different? yeah okay. yeah our front coupler is very different on the 80, 80s models um, from the uh, from the 70s yeah. models. The 70s are what I consider more of a traditional hitch, whereas our ball is like recessed in to the front. Um, looks quite different. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know what you got. The 80s yeah. are underslung, and if you're looking for parts for it, good luck. Uh, <laughs> so That's encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on that note, for those of us that have the 80s trailers, I hate to say it, the Hensley makes sense because now you don't have any wear there. Yeah. It no longer pivots on the ball. So you That's take true. all of that off the hitch. Mm -hmm. It goes into the Hensley and no longer on the ball. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a theory that they're harder to steal. <laughs> because you've got this whole monster thing mounted to the front and unless somebody happens to come along with a Hensley stinger that'll fit in there they can't they can't take it anywhere um but hitch locks are a whole nother night of topic <laughs> yeah. um, but 
that being said, make sure you guys are really locking up your avions well. We just had that one posted just the other day from, uh, where was it, from Alabama or Arkansas, Arkansas, uh, stolen from her um, because thieves think they're Airstreams that they can turn around and sell them for $80,000. So they don't know any different. So the air, the avions and the Airstreams are on the high level of theft these days. Yeah. Um, okay. And so any other questions on, on hitches in particular that you can think of can always come back, but, um, those measurements are important uh, to make, to, you know, get your trailer somewhere where it's level. Um, if you have to use, you know, a carpenter's level to figure that out for, for now, um, in the refrigerator, put it in the freezer, on the floor of the freezer with nothing in it, no food in it. And, um, and on your floor, you know, front to back, side to side, make sure it's level and then take those measurements off your front bumper or for your front of your trailer, front panel there and your rear, right? On the frame. On the frame, make sure that's, those are even. And then that's when you'll look at what your, what your hitch receiver, your you. ball is. And Go to the company website, watch some YouTubes, look at what people have what you feel comfortable with, then go into their website, put in the numbers of what your trailer weighs, your height of your receiver box on the vehicle, the ball hitch height, and they'll give you an idea of what of their product line is available for you to use. I mean, you can get them from on sale for 250 up to $400 on mm -hmm. sale. I mean, you don't have to go expensive, but you do want to, look at the name brands um, been in the business because it is your baby and you want to make sure it's safe okay and make sure when you uh, make sure you keep the the cup in the front of the trailer make sure that you lubricate that get some grease in there and make sure that you cross your chains when you hook them up underneath the truck Yep. You don't want the trailer to drop off the hitch and just drop straight down between the chains <laughs> if it ever did come off the hitch. Well, and there's that Airstream gentleman has a YouTube site that uh, he never put his pin in oh, yeah. for about 300 some odd miles. Oh, wow. And the only thing was holding it was this chain, and they were like thin cables Yeah. because it was so rusted in there. That <laughs> that was, that's your yeah. whole system. Yeah. Wow. That's scary when you get out and look at that and you go, oh, geez, I can't believe it. Yeah, he videotaped it, so I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. He fessed up to it, which was a good thing. But, I mean, yeah. and that's something that when we're hitching up to go, um, not that I profess to, you know, be a Hensley master or a hitch person at all, but I know what to look for. I mean, I do my own quick check, too, to make sure the chains are crossed, the, the um, break, you know, the, the runaway um, cord there is hitched in and the electric is put in right and stuff. So um, besides all the, you know, the lights working and things like that. I mean, that's just who here, my who here, check. Who here by a raise of hands has ever pulled their emergency brake cable and tested to make sure that it actually locks the brake? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say. And they have a life cycle any, some people will say five to ten years to replace them out. Yeah, because they're they're exposed, and if yeah. you don't put like electrical grease spray in there to make sure it doesn't just it connects properly. Yeah. Now on the on the seventy, uh, Bill and Cheryl, on your seventy six, you may or may not. Are you aware of where that little opening is on your? Uh, on your coupler, just behind your coupler, on the driver side. Driver side, there's a little hole, pinhole. a pinhole, and that is where you can put a pinhole, a pin, um, locking rod in there to hold that hitch secure. Okay. Yeah. yeah I thought it self-locked or something. It's got that. Mm -hmm. 
spring-loaded uh, mechanism. Or... Yeah, but that isn't fail-safe. Um, so no. yeah, Avion in the 70s, I don't know if prior to that, but in the 70s, um, and Curtis Parrish has a really good video. Um, I think he loaded it into the video files on the Avion uh, Trailer Owners Club Facebook page. Um, but if you just, yeah, Curtis, and it's uh, P-A-R-R-I-S-H, I think it is. Um, if you just even type in his name and ask him to put that video up again, he shows you exactly where it is and, and how to use it. Um, that's, that's a good addition. Once you hitch up, throw, throw a little, one of the little tiny pin locks in there, and that will help um, secure that latch from ever being able to come up while you're towing. Great. Yeah. Yep. Um, our 80s models doesn't have that, but no, we have, the traditional, lock we have the traditional lock. You can throw the lock through the top, wow. which you want to do as soon oh, yeah. as you get that tongue down in there. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, how about um, how to load your trailer itself with with gear like where should you put heavy stuff <laughs> <laughs> and how many kayaks can you fit off the back <laughs> and should you hang a bicycle rack <laughs> can you put the harley off the, the back, back bumper <laughs> right <laughs> No, <laughs> there are some Avion owners who will tell you not to put one thing off the back of your Avion, nothing. Um, but there are people who have pushed the envelope on that and they will claim that they haven't had any problem. But a lot of it is obviously making sure you don't overextend the whole weight so your axles are you know, crying, but also that you're distributing your gear or your stuff, your tchotchkes like me, um, <laughs> equally and more. 60-40. Yeah, there you go. 60-40, 60 40, 60 forward, 40 back is right. a traditional method. Right. So with our front kitchen, that's been much easier because that's there where a lot of the oh. stuff is. <laughs> no, move the computer. Move the computer. So with our front, our 32S has a front kitchen. So that actually has made the, that 60-40, 60 percent of your weight to the front of the of the midline. Um, that's actually made it a lot easier because that's where heavier stuff tends to be. I mean, right. your pots and pans, your canned goods, you know, all that kind of stuff, um, dishes and things. Um, but you know, when it comes to like his toolbox and stuff that weighs a ton. Um, you know, we that well, that one's in the truck. There's one in the truck. But um, yeah, try to try to portion things. Sixty percent of your weight should be in the front. And how do you test that, Kev? By taking it to a cat scale. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have been have taken your uh, rig hitched up to a cat scale? Anybody? I had to get mine reweighed when I re-registered it. Mm -hmm. Yours, when I had it, I had on a cat scale. And between truck and trailer, I believe I was fourteen eight. Yeah, we. Um, no. Kevin's Kevin's a little bit of an obsessive about this, no. but he, he works for DOT, so that's you gotta understand. Um, My friends work at the uh, state police. No. But we um, at the beginning of every season, before a trip, we will usually, you know, load what we figure we're going to be needing for the season because things change. Um, and we go, we have a cat scale that's only like two exits down from us. So um, we'll go. And when we got our new one, we actually went and weighed it empty and then came back and, you know, before our first trip, put our gear in and then we went back and loaded it again. And at a cat scale, you can then measure how much weight is in that front 
portion and the back portion. And I'll let you talk about that. So you have a weight on your vehicle, gross vehicle weight of that truck, maybe uh, 9,500, 9,700 or 10,000 pounds, depending on the year. So you load up all the truck with all your foodie and all the stuff you're gonna take camping, go to your cast scales. So you have that weight. Make sure you're not over the axle weights because the new truck label will have your front axle and your back axle. This is how much weight maximum you can put on it. And your gross vehicle combined weight of the truck. So you have that number. So if you look at that number, you're saying, okay, it all looks good. Then you get your camper, load it up with all your goodies and chotskis you're gonna take camping with you. Hook it back up, go back down to the cat scales. If you go back within 24 hours, it's like a five dollars charge for another weigh-in. So you weigh that in again, and you split your axle, because on the plates, you can split your axles. So you can split the front axle on one plate, another one there, and have your rear axle. So this will give you an idea of how much weight is on each axle, and how much weight is on your rear axle of your pickup truck or vehicle. Because you had the first way just for your truck, and then you have the second way with the trailer. So the combined difference between your rear axle, empty, I mean, without the trailer, then with the trailer on it, that will be your tongue weight. So you take that number and figure out how much your gross vehicle weight of the trailer should be. And if you're within that number of minimal 10%, maximum of 15, but ideally it's about 12 and a half, they ideally want maximum on, this, on that. So if you're all good to those numbers and your rear axle is not overloaded, and your front is level out when you park the vehicle, it's all level because you made your adjustments, shifting the weight forward or backwards, and you're good to go. Yeah. At some point, we're gonna actually take a video camera and go down to our CAT scale and, and do a video on that because it is a little daunting at first, especially when you're like Ooh. pulling in with all these 18 wheelers and they're looking at you like, what are you doing? <laughs> you <know? laughs> So, um, and you know, just, yeah, you have to, but they like them. The truckers like that Oh, the trucker. Oh yeah. They, they, they yeah. like that loom. Okay. Yeah, they do. They do. We got a lot of thumbs up at, at truck stops. Yeah. yeah. And now they have it on an app too. The cat scales, you can put it on your phone and app. So you don't even have to go inside the building anymore. You just drive up, punch it in, it reads it, it sends you an email and you can print it out later on at home. Well, also, um, at when I was, when we had a big carriage fifth wheel, that the carriage rallies, they would have people there, and I know they do at the DRV rallies as well, they actually have people there with devices that will weigh each tire of your trailer individually. Yep. So you know exactly how much weight each tire is carrying. Yes. Because in some cases they find people that, hey, this, you know, on one side of the trailer you're carrying a thousand pounds too much weight and on the other side it's too light and mm -hmm. you need to rebalance your load inside the trailer. Um, so I've often thought or I thought that that might be a good thing maybe at, at our annual rally would be to have those people out where, hey, if someone was interested, they could get the actual wheels on their trailer individually measured weight wise. Hmm. In, in a previous life, when I was in the military, I had to fly a boat. And when you put a load inside of an airplane, they weigh everything. <laughs> actual weight, pad weight, the whole bit. So I know what you're talking about with the portable scales, mm -hmm. right yeah. down to a pound. Yeah. Because the aircraft center of gravity depends on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And people are often surprised when they weigh, weigh all four corners of that, when they weigh all four tires or whatever, they're often surprised at how much variance there is in the weight each tire is carrying you assume that they're all gonna be roughly equal, but in a lot of cases, they're not. It's surprising actually. Well, and when you think of our trailers and the floor plan, um, most of them have the, I mean, we always encourage not traveling with any full fresh water, gray water or black water tanks. It's right. just a lot, a lot of extra weight that 
not only is it going to reduce your gas mileage, but um, it, you, you don't need to put that kind of stress on your on your straps that are holding those things, on your belly pan, on your frame, and all that jazz. But when avions are built, I mean, most of that is fairly centered, usually starting around the, the if you have a rear bath, it starts around that, uh, the middle or yeah, middle of your twin beds, if you have those and works yep. backwards. But you also, you know, look at where your, your refrigerator, your stove are usually, I mean, and those are heavier components and they're lined up on one side. So then on the other side, there's like nothing. Um, and so, yeah, where you store things to help counterbalance that is, uh, is worth, you know, really making a mental note because otherwise um, things will tend to get a little askew that way. And the yeah, more- I know ours has a fridge on one side and the stove on the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they weren't side by side. Yeah. Um, we pulled the old stove out anyways and now just have a stove top and a cabinet underneath. But mm -hmm. the stuff we store in that cabinet underneath is probably as heavy anyways as the old stove that used to be in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. pots and pans and a and an uh, electric toaster oven and you know, bowls, big bowls and things because yeah. we were able to make some big cabinets under there. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, you, you got propane tanks up front too, which help yeah. counterbalance the weight that you might have in the back. I mm -hmm. mean, the two, the 40 pound propane tanks, when they're full, are quite heavy. And, right. you know, we had our dinette convert our couch in the front converted into a dinette. And so I'm sure that's heavier than the old couch was. We're probably actually weighted more towards the front than we are towards the rear in ours now. Mm. Well, if you go to the CAT scale and you have your measurements, your weight, then right. you have a better idea of what's going on and how much tongue weight you actually have. And it doesn't fall within that 10% up to maximum of 15%. But. Right. Yeah. Yep. Kevin has, um, he purchased that, it's a tongue weight scale, right? Yeah. He, we purchased, uh, he purchased a tongue weight scale um, that we have talked about bringing to a rally, because a lot of people don't know what their tongue weight is. Um, purchased it and, and for our own use, but bringing it to a rally. And like you said, Jeff, kind of, you know, going around saying, would you, you know, would you like to know what your, what your real tongue weight is? <laughs> um, yeah. There's yeah. actually a way to do it with a bathroom to scale if you have, you know, I've seen the videotape, you know, yeah. do the lever, do the cantilever, and you can, you can work it with a bathroom scale. <laughs> uh, it's primitive, but it works. <laughs> yeah. The, the other thing that um, especially people who are first-time owners of these trailers, I, what I see consistently is people will – read that outside little you know original manufacturer emblem where it has the weights and stuff on there but they don't take into account that that was before the air conditioner was put on the roof that was before um you know a, a antenna you know a new antenna system was put on or before the yeah you read the manual it says driveway yeah it's empty tank down. That's yeah, a that's, strip, that's a stripped down model. Right, right. But people look at that and they say, oh, well, yeah, my Ford Taurus will tow this. And it's like, no, no, it won't. Um, and <laughs> those are, and, and, you know, if the floor was replaced, what was it replaced with? Um, yeah. You know, that could be a totally different weight and weight distribution with those kinds of aftermarket over 35 years of changes um, yeah. that can are yeah that can make a big difference or some people you know take out the big refridge and put in only a little one well then they picked up a little bit we took out the 1987 700 pound microwave <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's an empty cabinet now so um, you know we were feel I was feeling good about that 
Um, more Trotskys. <laughs> yeah, the more Trotskys. That's what exactly. And what that's I what said. in there. Yes. That's exactly what I said. No, it actually has become our project box, and everything that's in there is like to do things. It's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. So should ask, him, ask anybody has questions. We move other, on. Yeah. Other almost at our at our nine o'clock and i i hope that we i hope we provided some answers for things but um hey, yeah new, you you folks that are first timers with us what other questions do you have oh uh, i've got a nice very nice <laughs> list of notes um <laughs> and some things to look up uh as far as the hitches go, um, I would ask, uh, I was, we were looking at a six liter GM for, uh, you probably have a slightly lighter camper in the 32S, but uh, it's a sort of a general question, but if, if, if the six liter GM gas engine is enough to pull a 34 around the country. Hey, uh, Emily and I'm sorry, I lost your name, but I'm not seeing him. Aaron. Aaron. Um, you go to the manufacturer's website for the year of vehicle. Mm -hmm. it'll tell you what the vehicle was rated for towing it. Yep. Now, for you, with Maine being a heavy salt laden area, um, look at eBay and possibility buying a vehicle out of the area to avoid the salt belt. Mm. Um, or go to Auto Nation. You know, go to Florida, go to Southwest, and you can probably pick up an earlier vehicle cleaner. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. My O2 came out of California. Um, the 102 that I have came out of Cali, so it's clean. Mm-hmm. And I have the other one is a Northeast truck, as I call it, and it has the rust of a Northeast truck. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's an option when you go buy and go shopping. Yeah. Yep, that's, that's our general formula for all vehicles. Um, I tend to buy cheaper, older stuff. And once you hit 15 years up here, there, it's pretty sketchy how many years you can actually get out of it at that point. So. Uh, uh, definitely Southern vehicle. Uh, your your camper, Dave, is 14,800 pounds with like no. your normal load. Is that what you said? No, that was. Oh, no. no. 14, that was 32S when I weighed truck and trailer together, gross vehicle weight. Um, oh, okay, okay. 14.5 at the time. I made a note and I was really kind of mind boggled, but. Um, that explains it. <laughs> vehicle weight. Yeah. Gotcha. So, and, uh, yep. And I wasn't kidding about tchotchkes because when we weighed our 32, ask Dave, now, okay, with our truck and all our gear, we were at ooh 17,600. Okay. Uh, so you must have had like one t shirt, one pair of socks. No. <laughs> but what's the difference in the trucks? <laughs> yeah. Uh, our That's truck a lot of bubble size with diesel, so I would say we're about the same weight. Okay. Uh, okay. My next big project on my 34 is the floors coming up. Uh oh. Oh dear. Um, Aaron, I was going to mention that um, we found our truck on using Carfax, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and it was at a Toyota? No, no. 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 It was at a a dealership in New Jersey that sold no pickup trucks. <laughs> so they were just like, they got this thing in in a trade mm. and it was in, I mean, super, it had what, 8,000 miles on 28, it? 28,000. Okay, whatever. <laughs> um, 28,000 miles on it, um, but in just beautiful, you know, no rust. Um, with the cap, yeah, the cap to match and the whole, the high back mm -hmm. cap and everything, which we know we need for full-time living because um, mm -hmm. we've sold the house. We have no ties. I mean, it's, yep. it's going to be whatever we have on wheels, that's what we own. Um, 
what you want to do though when you're looking at a truck and when you're looking at any tow vehicle is you want to see the door tag on it and you want to see what your axle ratios are yeah. and you want to check and make sure does it have a heavy duty tow package you have to have a transmission cooler you have to have you know the heavy duty radiator um the stronger alternator and things like that that will charge the trailer while you're driving and everything else you you want to make sure that it's got a tow package on it and you don't want like a 310 rear end or something like that um you'll you'll want to make sure it's got a towing rear end on it um you know at least a 355 or yeah you, you know, want to be somewhere probably three and a half 373 yep as high as 410 if yeah. you're going for the gas, six liter, it's the 410. Yeah. Ideally yeah. for the gas and the GM, the Chevys, it's the 410. Yeah. And there, there's a code, there's an axle code on the door plate. And they can, if it, in some cases, I know on AutoNation, in a lot of cases, they actually take a picture of that door tag mm -hmm. and you can see the axle code. And then you can go on the website for that particular year and make of truck. And you can go with the axle code and it'll tell you what the gear ratio is for that code. Yeah, so yeah. if they don't have it, I would not drive 750 miles for a good deal and then find out you're getting a truck with no tow package and no, you know, a 310 to one rear axle or something like that. You're not gonna be happy with that. No. If you're going with the diesel trucks, the gear ratios are pretty standard. You know, yeah. if the diesel, this is the rear end you're going to get, unless they spec the optional gear. But a minimum will be, I'll say, 373, three and a half minimum. Yeah. In my O2, you could only get it with a 373. Yeah. Unless you were in a 450 or 550, and then you were in the 488 gears. You don't want to deal with that. That's just. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's got bottom end grunt, but no top end. Yeah, that's the thing is certain trucks are certainly certainly spec'd, uh, you know, a certain way from the factory. So, so I know with our Expedition as an example, I've got the 331 rear end. And okay. The, and I can still, when, when I pull away on the freeway or something, I still out accelerate most cars. Um, with that EcoBoost, just because it's such a powerful engine. But I wish that I'd have known ahead of time a little bit and waited a little bit longer. I would have gotten an Expedition with the, with the optional 373. You just have to wait a lot longer to get one because they're, they're rare. But you could go ahead and re-gear the truck if you wanted to yourself. You can, and I've actually thought about looking into doing that, having the 373 rear end installed in the truck. But what? But when you do that, they have to reflash the, you know, the EEPROM and they your your speedometer. Everything's all based on all of that, so the computer has to be flashed. I'm not sure what all would be involved there, but but I may talk to my local mechanic here and just find out how much it would cost to do that. Go to a four wheel drive shop because those guys that lift their rigs and put the bigger tires on it, they do it all the time. They yeah. You're aging back to what the original system was set up for. Right. Yeah. Because I do have the heavy duty tow package. I just don't have the rear end that I would like to have. You know, spend $1,200 and re-gear it. The flashing is probably pretty relatively minor, actually. Yeah. Yep. So versus gas versus diesel, you're going to pay for diesel eight to twelve thousand dollars more, depending on the manufacturer. So you have to understand, figure out how much more that's going to make up in fuel cost. Well, and I, I, for myself at this point in my life, I don't know if I would buy diesel again with the new emissions that the diesels have. Um, if I have to replace a truck, I'm likely to go to the Ford with the new 7.3 gas engine. It's got the torque numbers. Yeah. You know, it's and still your gas, 
Yeah, and regardless of what a lot of people claim and whatever, every vehicle I've ever driven, if I'm towing about 70 miles an hour, I'm getting about 10 miles per gallon, regardless of whether it's diesel or gas. If I slow down to 60, 62, I can get up to 12 to 15 miles per gallon, depending on weather conditions, regardless of whether it's diesel or gas. So, you know, you just kind of got to go, if you're planning on traveling a lot of back roads and, and kind of those types of areas, you're not as likely to find diesel in a easily accessible location, especially if you're towing a third foot trailer, it can be difficult getting in and out of some gas stations. You see a lot of avions with scrapes down the side of them toward the back because people have tried to fit them into a tight gas station and they scrape the trailer on the concrete pump protectors as they pull through the island. Mm -hmm. So that's what I like about our little 23 is I can fit that thing anywhere. <laughs> In fact, that was a discussion that Kevin and I had on our way out to the Avion rally because we needed to get gas and we were on Route 90 through very built up urban areas and had to get off. And more and more and more of these gas stations are building their pumps perpendicular Mm -hmm. Instead of parallel, they're perpendicular for safety reasons or whatever, so they can read the plate numbers and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's becoming more and more difficult when instead of, you know, the truck stop is a truck stop. That's easy. But a regular, you know, neighborhood gas station, it's becoming mm -hmm. much more difficult to find um, gas stations that you can, you can pull into. Um, Something that helps with that, if you have enough time to plan, is you can actually do, you know, the Google satellite, put yourself down there on the road if you need to, and figure out if that gas station you're going to be able to get in there or not. Um, there's a couple apps and things like that, too, that, that help with that, but we've noticed that, too. Um, and, in fact, when we pulled into that one, we said, whew, glad we don't have a 34 because I don't think we, I don't think we would have made it. Um, Louise, uh, both of my trucks, I have added the Titan fuel tank. So yeah. Yeah. in the short bed, it's around 50 gallons. In my long bed, I'm about 65 gallons. Yeah, yeah. And I can do maybe 700 miles. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. if I'm stopping, that's the other thing to check if you're buying the truck, because a lot of trucks will be set up with a tow package or whatever, but then they've got the factory, the smallest gas tank you can buy. And again, you're going to be finding, you're going to be looking for a gas station every 100, 150 miles. And that mm -hmm. just gets really, that's tough. That gets you're really in Montana. Terrible after a while. <laughs> yeah. You, you start planning how far you can go based yeah, on or parts of Texas. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yep. so the expedition has a nice big, I think it's around 26 or 29 gallons, something like that. I can go a long ways. But I know when my father, he was towing his travel trailer with his F-150, he only had the 23 gallon tank. Oh my goodness. And he had the V8 and he was you know, he was having to pull over real often. You pretty much have to stop at almost every gas station when you're in rural areas, especially. Yeah. So, um, so I, in, I'm just going to, maybe we'll take like another 10 minutes or so, but Jeff brought up speed and I just have to do my little <laughs> speed pitch here. In my, it is my opinion, but these poor babies were built when the speed limit on the highways was 55. I'm old enough to remember that. And as am I. <laughs> they, and they're not, they're, they really don't want to go 70, 70. I mean, last, last week we had some, oh yeah, I'm doing like 75. I'm like, oh my gosh, no, no, no. Um, you know, a lot can happen. The difference between going 55 to 60 and 70 to 75 can be a nightmare of difference for lack of control, for damage to your vehicle uh, or your trailer. Um, so please, please, 
you know, drive intentionally and drive, you know, take it. I mean, I grew up where Kevin and I just had this discussion the other day when, I mean, my dad always had boat trail, you know, we had boats, we had trailers. And the, the rule of thumb was always when you towed anything, you always were at least five miles under the posted speed limit. I mean, that was like, that yeah. was just highway courtesy. I mean, that was just road courtesy. That was just the way it was. Um, so, you know, these, these things are, they're not really engineered to go 75 miles. Yeah, you have to look at the speed ratings of the tires as well. Boat mm. trailers and things like that, particularly back back in the time that you're discussing. Yeah, well, you know, those tires were probably only rated at 50 or 55 miles per hour. Yeah, and they were and, car tires. General yeah. tires. Company. Yeah, and so the tires, the tires I currently have on the trailer are rated at 75. <laughs> And the, the Goodyear Endurance tires that I'm going to be putting on are rated at 85. Oh, now, yeah. I, I never plan to drive 85 miles an hour towing the trailer. Oh, my tires say again. <laughs> so but, we're going to call you the silver bullet as you yeah. wait. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, if you're driving through West Texas and it's straight for about 75 miles, and the traffic is doing 85 miles an hour when the when people go by you at 80 or 85 miles an hour if you're doing 60 or 65 you are getting blown all over the road and so part of what i drive 74 on the freeway is because i want to close up that distance i want to not have such a great variance of speed Speed between me and the other traffic on the road. Uh, I just feel better that way and that's why I do it and you know I'm still in a lot of places I'm still five miles an hour under the speed limit at 70. All right. And it's so, something that we've talked about on speed and towing but we haven't talked about is our axle temperatures, bearing temperatures. A good thing to invest in is an infrared RAR gun Go ahead and get on the road for half an hour, 30, you know, to an hour maybe. Pull over and walk around your trailer with your infrared gun and see what your bearing temperatures are doing. Yeah. Um, they should be within a few degrees of everything going around. Yeah. Uh, that's your predisclosure to, oh, shit, I got a bearing going bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, check, I check mine at every gas station whenever I stop to get gas. I walk around the trailer before I get back in and mm -hmm. I don't have an infrared tester, but I go and I put my hands on the wheels and I check each wheel individually and make sure that the temperatures are all roughly the same and that it's cool. If you touch a rim and it's so hot you can't keep your hand there, then you got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and tire pressure monitors yeah. on your trailer, on the trucks. So you know the pressures, you know your temperatures. So they're all we're just, just looking for as long as they're in the same ballpark. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing 20, 50 degrees difference. Yeah. You have an issue happening. If you're gonna get tire pressure monitors though, I'd recommend steel steel valves. Yes, right. you have to have steel valves. Because the tire pressure monitors will shake and they'll they'll tear a rubber valve up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would prefer that he drove 60, 65, but <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I made him do that when we had the great big trailers, because you know when you're towing forty feet behind you, I I don't want him doing seventy, and so he would he would keep it between sixty and sixty five. But he thinks now because the trailer's smaller, he can go you know <laughs> seventy in that. But I really wish he wouldn't. <laughs> well, I calculate the difference on the road because I'm still working, so we have to get somewhere to enjoy the vacation and if you want to travel 1200 miles on a weekend you know if you if you if you calculate the time that it takes you to drive 600 miles at 60 and 600 miles at 70 that's a substantial difference in time yeah. and if you look at it over the course of an entire trip where you're driving 4000 miles or something like that you can save yourself half a day of driving time 
just with that five or 10 mile an hour difference. But, you know, it's up to everyone, as long as you're within the speed limit, but, and what you feel safe doing. You know, I come across RVers, even at 70, I get passed all the time by people towing trailers, driving their big motor homes and everything. They're doing 80 miles an hour at least. And sometimes you'll see those people 20 miles down the road on the side of the road yeah. putting a new tire on because yeah. the trailer tires aren't meant for that. Remember now, those Chinese tires are basically rated for 60, 65 miles an hour at best. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, any, we're at 9.15, so any other, um, you know, burning questions or anything like that? Otherwise, we'll just... We'll wrap it up for tonight. I hope that this has given everybody some information. Dennis, do you have any last words of wisdom on towing to share? I would encourage everybody to watch that video uh, that I did post. Um, it's on our blog, uh, thepewterpalace.com. It's the, it's the most recent one, and it's a link to that YouTube video. Well, you know, as far as the, the towing speed, um, the beauty about being retired, I'm not in a hurry to get anywhere anyway. So we generally cruise 60, maybe 65 miles an hour with a tailwind. And I just enjoy the ride. I'm not in a hurry to get there. Uh, and then there's a safety factor like uh, it's been mentioned. Uh, where you see a, a stick and a staple trailer go blown past 80, 85 miles an hour, 12 miles down the road, either they're changing a new tire or the thing is scattered all over the freeway. I've seen that happen. <laughs> So it's just yeah. it's just not worth it, you know, for me anyway. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we wish everyone well. Um have a have a terrific week. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Hopefully Lee, you'll we'll see you again soon. It's kind of one of those drop in when you can. And um if you have ideas on future topics, I know Den uh Dave had asked about insurance. And I'm going to work on uh, getting a speaker that we saw um, do a presentation on that. I just haven't been able to connect with them yet. But um, if you have ideas and things like that, you can always post them on, you know, either on the Travel Club Facebook page or send us a message or on our blog or whatever. Okay. okay. All right. Good. All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. All right. Bye. 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 Thanks. Awesome.